Two and a half years ago, uh, I was on the island of Patmos. And uh, it, I walked down the narrow steps down to the cave where Revelation was supposedly written. And uh, among the shrines, which were a little disappointment to me, but among the shrines, then there was also, the, our guide pointed out, this is probably where John laid, you know, to spend the night and this kind of thing. And there was this little hole in the side of the cave over here. And she said, our guide said, that's where he laid his head. Oh. And I thought, come on. Yeah. <laughs> now, I realize my hat size is bigger than some. But I don't think my head would hardly even fit in there, much less if I'd turn and scrape my nose or whatever. I mean, anyway, I was kind of, I was kind of disappointed a little bit in the cave, and uh, but but uh, you know, and and if it was, if I could think about uh, my opinion, if I got forced to to uh, stay on an island. You know, if I got forced on this, I wouldn't be up in some hole in the rock somewhere. I'd be on the beach. <laughs> now, not that I, you know, anyway. Food is easier. Water is probably easier. All sorts of life. Was, now, maybe he had to go. I don't know. That's the tradition up there. But one blessing after being there, uh, you know, the... Our group gathered uh, up above the cave, kind of along the road, before we got back on the bus to travel a little further, and uh, we read a portion of Revelation, and we had a word of prayer, and it just kind of refocused me a little bit, and we went on to see some other things that are connected with the Apostle John, and that kind of thing. But I'm, I was just reminded, though, that John was there, according to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, he was there for the word of the Lord and for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why he was there. Now, that could be taken in different ways, and that may indicate his uh, banishment to that island, that kind of a thing. Our group, uh, our group also, uh, we, we toured the cave and we toured the, a monastery that's there and we toured a, a museum and didn't have much time in the museum. We we're running out of daylight. But uh, you'd, think a guy that, uh, you'd think a guy that has been to Patmos, saw the cave, and all that good stuff would really have a handle on Revelation. <laughs> so I am going, no. <laughs> uh, I, no, I, I, I kind of feel like that I could study this a lifetime and not get it. And just studying this passage of chapter 11, uh, 11 alone, and that's, we're going we're gonna to really focus on chapter 11, but we'll look a few other places. But uh, even looking at chapter 11, I, I'm, I'm re I realize that I need to go back and dig into the Old Testament. I need to, I need to be digging through this whole the whole book of Revelation to get a handle on, the, on what's going on here. And so uh, and I, I think if we would do the whole thing, I'd, we'd be running out of daylight tonight. So uh, I'm gonna, we're going to keep it, uh, we're going to try to zero in on that passage and some key points that we find there. One of the things you're going to find with uh, my approach to the, to the book of Revelation that is that I'm taking the futurist view. There are several views of Revelation, but, uh, but we as dispensationalists take a futurist view that all of Revelation takes place in the future. Amen. Notice I said all. That includes the first few chapters, which some of those that are, are holding to the futurist view will plug the body of Christ in there. Because it says the word church. Well, we know the word church uh, doesn't always mean the body of Christ in the scripture. So we need to be Bereans and that kind of thing. But we take a futurist view and uh, we're gonna, we, we recognize that this, this, the events that we're looking at tonight will be in the future as the whole book is really in the future. Uh, the, the message tonight will tie in somewhat with last night's message in that chapter, uh, you know, we're going to see from, we're going to see the beast that we talked about last night in chapter 17. And we're going to see the idea that, uh, that this passage is, uh, is uh, similar in that, uh, you know, like chapter 17, we kind of had an expanded view. Reading Revelation, it just doesn't go real smoothly chronologically. A lot of times it takes a detour. A lot of times it, uh, it expands on a point. 
And uh, I know some of you know I'm a hunter and we've had a little, I've discussed a little with some of you, so, so uh, I'm going to tell you, if I was going to tell you a hunting story and all I said, uh, yeah, I got one. <laughs> now some of you would have said, all right, that's good, let's go on. <laughs> you know? But then, but some of you, some of you would say, come on, one what? At least you'd ask that, right? And then if I'd say, well, a bear. And then, then some of you can, some of you say, oh, that's plenty, that's plenty. And uh, then you, then maybe, but then some of you, you'd have to, well, what kind of bear? What gun did you use? Where were you? How come, you know, uh, did, you, did he charge you? And all that, and all that excitement, you know, and, and uh, that kind of thing. So, anyway, bear in mind with me. <laughs> you got it! <laughs> Kevin, this is a pretty easy crowd. <laughs> This is a pretty easy crowd, yeah. So bear in mind with me that John is writing here in this context. John is is expanding. I mean, he's just kind of he's almost diverting from timelines and everything else to uh, to give us a picture of of two witnesses. He he's just kind of taking a break from any kind of you know all the extra stuff that we might have to that, that clouded my mind for weeks as I was studying this. But uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a focus on these two witnesses, and he's kind of in this chapter just expanding the thought and uh, showing, us, showing us about these guys. Now, like I said, we could go back to the Old Testament because there's Old Testament, there's prophecy, there's, there's uh, parables we could look at that would tie in somewhat with this. And if you want all that stuff, go buy the books for, by Paul's Adam. All right? A little plug there. But anyway, one of the things we, we do need to realize, this is prophecy, not mystery. This is prophecy, not mystery. That's why it ties in so well with the Old Testament. That's why it ties in with, with the Gospels and the parables that Jesus told. And so we need to recognize that idea. But what we're going to do is we're just going to look at the book of Revelation here in chapter 11, and we are, we're going to just do something simple here. We're gonna just, just going to try to answer who, what, when, where, how, why. You know, just, I mean, you don't know what's going on somewhere, you've got to get, get to the basics. And what more basic can you do is just kind of try to answer those questions. And uh, interestingly, we will, you'll notice on the outline that we're going to look at verse 3 an awful lot. And, but look with me first of all, Revelation chapter 1, we're going to read the first 13, 14 verses here. Or, chapter 11, did I say 1? Chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11 and verse 1, and we'll read a few verses here and uh, look at these two witnesses. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New King James, and it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to, to, to my two witnesses. Here it jumps right out at us. And uh, we have that emphasis on the witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. The God of the earth, excuse me. Verse 5. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this, this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in, uh, in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony... The beast, here he is, remember we talked, we had quite an emphasis last night. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts. Can you imagine that? Yeah. 
Wow, anyway, send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, saying to them Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. I hope tonight that we can give glory to the God of heaven. Amen. We've had great music that has directed our attention that way. And uh, from the very first hymn, How Great Thou Art. And if there's nothing else I, that I want you to take away from today is that as we look at these details and uh, yeah, we, we're not going to answer everything to everyone's satisfaction, but I want to give glory to God in heaven. Amen. Let's read verse 14 because I want to get to 15 later. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So as we look at this context and just kind of uh, begin with who? Well... Verse 3 says, my two witnesses. Who's the my? Yeah, so we got a double who here, don't we? Who's the my? Well, uh, an angel is talking, but where do angels come from? God. They're messengers of God. So ultimately, whether you're going to argue over this is, this is an angel speaking or God speaking, it really doesn't matter because these two witnesses are sent from God. They're supernaturally empowered to do their job. And... Uh, However, be careful. It does not mean that they are angels. That's not what this means. I think maybe some might drift that direction. These are men. They're two men. Now, it does not have to mean that they are two men that have previously existed. I know that's kind of the popular, the popular trend is to say, well, this is Moses and Elijah because of the transfiguration, or this is, Moses, or this is uh, Enoch and Elijah because the, neither of them died and is appointed on the man wants to die. Fine. I'm not going to argue that, but I don't, think you have, I don't think we have enough proof in Scripture to, uh, to nail it down. I think that's somewhat, somewhat speculation. Again, maybe you ought to read the books. To, to get the detail, but uh, so if if uh, if you came here tonight to hear that I'm going to identify who these are, you're dismissed. <laughs> anyway, however, I'll, I'll just kind of give a little a little emphasis here that uh, the scripture prophecy does tell us that Elijah is going to come before Christ. Malachi chapter four uh, does tell us Elijah is coming. However, Jesus said Elijah, Elijah had come in Matthew chapter 17, 12 and 13. And then in Matthew 11, chapter 12 to 14, he said it was John the Baptist. But let me throw another monkey wrench in there for you. John the Baptist said in John chapter 1 and verse 21, when he was asked if he was Elijah, he said no. So... We have some things to deal with, don't we? When you look at the idea, if, if, that's, if that's the direction we want to go, and uh, even that. I think there's some explanations for that. Uh, for instance, uh, there, you know, the, there's the belief today that people will say, well, it's going to be Elijah that's going to come back. And so even, even believers today, grace believers today, believe that literal Elijah is going to come back. And uh, that this is who this is going to talk about. On the other hand, uh, I, and I think that was, that was a, uh, a thought that even the Jews had uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament. Some of the Jewish scholars uh, went that direction. And so when John answered, no, I'm not him, no, I'm not the literal Elijah, I'm John. You know, Zechariah's my, my dad and Elizabeth's my mom, you know, they knew where he came from. So he could say that. On the other hand, it may be a contextual thing when Jesus said it one Jesus said yeah John really fulfills the role and uh, that was the idea that Jesus was meaning and so it could be the difference in context I'm gonna let you wrestle with that a little bit more because we got we got a few more questions to answer but on the other hand uh, when we see when we look at John we will look at these witnesses they both come in, in if you'll give me a little latitude with the wording there in the spirit of Elijah 
they come with this with the with the, the force of a, of a message like Elijah, and they, they, uh, they come with, the, with the, the power of God. And that's definitely evident in their message. The, the scripture also that we read in uh, verse 4 here told, told us that they are olive trees and lampstands. Wow. Olive trees and lampstands. How does that figure into things? Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 14 is a good cross-reference to that that talks about there's an angel that identifies two olive trees as two who were anointed to serve the Lord. So they're anointed to serve the Lord back there in Zechariah. And I have some of these on, on your notes. By the way, if you don't have some notes to fill in the blanks, we're giving you a cheat sheet up here to follow along if you want to do that. If you don't have a note, you raise your hand and maybe we got an usher. I don't know. If, yeah, we. Oh, we're out of them? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Too many people showed up. Yeah, disgusting in that these problems of in the in the blessing to be here and uh, in, uh, Thank you. I, I I'm just I'm just tickled watching Wes lead the singing. Aren't aren't you? I'm you you believe Wes is enjoying this? Oh man. And and if you're sitting in the front, if you're sitting in the front, I mean this I mean, it just feels like the roof's about ready to raise here with your... So, man, it's just been a blessing here to be here and, and just, to, uh, just to hear you sing and all that. So, anyway, now where was I? Oh, yes, these, these two guys. I'm going to let you look at Zechariah on your own, but they were anointed by God. Their number is two. That's something else that tells us who they are. And it's, it's just typical in the Old Testament that two or three witnesses... Uh, validate, a, validate a, a matter. Amen. They were that's that's just the Old Testament principle from Deuteronomy chapter 19, and this one struck me. Note too that like John, when their job is done in verse seven, they die. When their job is done, God takes them, and. Should you and I think any differently? I've, I've heard it over and over again for, from elderly. I don't know why I'm still here. The, the verse that BBI is using, and Rob said I'd get a free shirt, free shirt for mentioning it. No. <laughs> but the verse that BBI is using, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, says that we're saved and called according to, the, to God's purpose. If God has saved you, God has called you, you have a purpose to fulfill in this life. You have, you have a purpose in this life, and it has to do with ministry, and when, when God is done with you, Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We're promoted to glory. And I, I hope you're confident. I hope you're content to trust the Lord that He has you here this moment to hear those words. That He has me here to speak those words. So who are these witnesses? They're God's witnesses. That's who they are. And I'm not going to go any further than that with the who. With the who. You can dig a little deeper all you wish. Let's look at the what. Go back to verse 3 if you would. Just take a look at verse 3 again. Note I mentioned that several of these are answered right in the first introduction that we have to these guys. But in verse 3 he says, And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy. So what are they about? They're prophesying. I put the verb there on purpose. The idea that they, they're, they're about the business of prophecy. How are they doing it? Well, how are they witnessing? They're, they're prophesying. They're giving the message that God give, gave them. Their dress is part of their message. Their dress is part of their message. They're clothed in sackcloth. And they perform miracles. All of those things, all of those things tie together to bring the message that, that uh, God had them bring. Now, what is the exact message? You don't see it spelled out, you know, in point by point by point here, what the message is that these guys are bringing, but we can draw a few things together, and, uh, uh, but I'm going to quote uh, William R. Newell's commentary on Revelation. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights of the five things he believes that are contained in their message. And uh, some of these 
you might have to go a little broader than this exact passage, but I'm going to just share these with you. He, he says, the test, their, their testimony, their witness will be that Christ is Lord of all. Now, I didn't give you a cheat sheet on this, did I? You're going to have to write them down. So I'm going to abbreviate these, but Christ is Lord of all. That's, that's one of the things that they will be emphasizing. Uh, number two, they're going to be confronting man's wickedness. I think you could tie that back to the verse, uh, verse 2, the measuring rod type idea. Number three, and this one, this one is kind of interesting. God's past judgments, they were from God. And I think what, he's, what Newell is saying there is that these guys are going to be pointing to other places where God, God judged people, God judged his people, and uh, the point is, is that God is sovereign, God is char in charge, God is the judge. Then number, uh, number four, he is going to be countering, their message is going to be countering the beast's claims. He's going to be countering the beast's claims. And number five is something that we've read already or will read here, that Jerusalem is likened unto Sodom and Egypt. Sodom and Egypt. Those are some potent things. Their dress of sackcloth, like the Old Testament prophets, indicates a personal sadness with, their state of, with the state of things in Jerusalem and in the temple. He's, they, they, they were to, you know, the angel was to measure. I think these guys are right in line with that measurement and they're just, they're reacting or responding to that type of a measurement that's going, that, uh, that they find, that the angels find. And so, uh, remember, this is a time of God's wrath in the tribulation. And so, that, that's all, that all comes into the picture here. It's a sobering message they have to give like the prophets of old would put on sackcloth to show their, their sadness, that kind of a thing. Uh, Matthew Henry, Henry's commentary just briefly summarizes it, and it says, sackcloth shows their afflicted, persecuted state and deep sorrow for the abominations against which they protest. And so there's a, there's a, that's a loaded statement, I think. Again, and back to verse 3, uh, I think most of our translations have the word power there, but if you notice carefully, it's in italics. There is no word there, but that's just the nature of the Greek in this, in this context. But there's definitely the indication of power in the context here. In the context, you, you find that they have power to defend themselves uh, against anyone who desires to harm them. Anybody intent on, on getting them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I found this picture... My secretary found it, okay. Uh, but we found this picture that just depicts a fire coming out of their mouth, and that's what the scripture tells us here. But I, I, I wonder if that's exactly what that means, you know. But somehow, somehow what comes out of their mouth is going to destroy the enemies, it's going to protect them, that kind of a thing. Quite the, uh, quite the statement. Uh, they also sh demonstrate authority over, the, over nature. In that, like Moses with the plagues, they, oh, is that a hint that Moses is the guy? Okay, anyway. But, but anyway, they, uh, they, they bring plagues like no rain and, and water turned to blood and that kind of a thing like Moses had as, as they desire. I think another miracle that validates their ministry is that, is that, when, when, uh, that when God takes them to heaven in verses 11 and 12. It's going to validate their ministry and just show that it's, it's one of the miracles associated with them. And then I think there's another one. And, and uh, you notice part of, our text, uh, part of our text in the brochure says Revelation chapter 7. There's 144 witnesses. Come on back to Revelation 7 with me briefly. Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> and in this, in this context... Uh, I don't know, have you ever called, have you ever heard the 144,000 called witnesses themselves? I wondered as I was given this topic, are, were they asking should the two, it didn't say the two witnesses, it just said two witnesses is my title. And uh, were they thinking the two or were they thinking two and then 144,000? You guys will have to tell me. I got, uh, my thinking is, I, I guess I should have asked before I started. <laughs> But I got so much in chapter 11, I can hardly... Anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, but but the, I, my thinking is, is that the 144,000 are the result of, they are the result of the, uh, the, the witness of the two. Amen. I think it's more of a result of the witness of the two as we, and, and uh, so anyway, I'm just going to leave it at that for a second, but let's, let's read this context in uh, Revelation 7. And... I'm going to pick up, I'm going to, I know we've got to jump into it here. Let's just jump in in verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And I guess we probably have to go back earlier and, and you see the idea that they are sealed in their forehead. Uh, I'm not going to go into that great detail. I just want to emphasize that, that these, these, I believe, are the result of the ministry of the two witnesses. They're connected to them. Now there's a difference between them, a lot of difference. And we see that they were listed and you have the 12 tribes that, are, that they are listed from. And, uh, but let me just make a comment, a, a little application along the way as we think about the result of the two reaching 144,000. God uses people even today. That's, my, that's part of my reasoning for thinking that the 144,000 are a result of these two. But God uses people in a, and God can use you. And just some of the encouragement that we've had through this week already to, to let the Lord just be, just be a part of you. Let the Lord be seen in your life. Just some of the messages that we've had so far. Uh, I think that it kind, of, uh, it kind of adds to that idea. But ultimately, you have a purpose, and that purpose is, is reaching others as well. So God wants to use you to reach others, and so God uses people he always has, and I think in the, in the tribulation he will as well. And that's where these two, these two are going to reach the 144,000. Back up, back up in uh, chapter 6 of Revelation. Hopefully you've not left the context here. Back up to chapter 6 and verse 16 of Revelation. And again, we're jumping a little bit into it. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Okay, and so we have just kind of the context showing the wrath. Verse uh, chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 7. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the, with, to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And so you notice there's somewhere along the line, God's wrath is being poured out, somewhere along the line, somewhere in the, in the, uh, in the, the, the activities that God has planned and God is doing, there's a kind of a pause to rescue these 144,000, seal them, and uh, somehow protect them. And I'll, I'll give a little interpretation there. I believe this is protection for the tribulation period. I think there's a protection through the tribulation period for these 144,000. Uh, and anyway, I'm, I'm going to keep moving on in our, in our context. But let me also say, these are not the only ones that are saved in the tribulation. I don't know how many times I've been asked that question. Well, can anybody ever get saved in the tribulation? Well, you better believe they can according to, according to let me find my reference uh, right here somewhere. Uh, that that uh, now I lost my spot here. Chapter seven, maybe. Yeah, I'm in chapter seven here, isn't it? Right after. Oh yeah, it's verse nine, isn't it? Yes. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, as no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so during the tribulation period there will be a great number of people that are saved and 
Now, notice, notice you have the 144,000 set apart. These guys are going to survive and go into the kingdom with the Lord. We'll see that in, uh, in chapter 14. I think I already meant to take you there, but sorry. Uh, we'll get there. But uh, I, that's God's plan for them, that they are going to enter into the, the kingdom with the Lord. That's why I think that's, that's why they were sealed and that special thing. But there's other, there are other people that are saved during this time. And uh, these people then will, uh, they could be martyred or, you know, whatever might happen to them uh, because it's not going to be an easy time in, in the tribulation for anyone who, who turns to the Lord. But come to Revelation chapter 14 with me. We'll, we'll take care of that right now. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. And, and let me show you that... <clears throat> In the, in the tribulation, we have some information about these 144,000. So the two, witness to the 144,000, great multitudes are saved, God's at work in the tribulation. But in chapter 14, look with me in the first uh, few verses here. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him and with him, 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And where we're standing here, we're on Mount Zion. You can compare that to Zechariah 14. You can compare that to other places in the scripture. When the Lord comes back, he comes back to Mount Zion to set up his kingdom. That's where the return of the Lord is going to be. And with him are 144,000. And they're, they're ready to establish the kingdom. Verse uh, 2. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who, who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, etc. But notice the 144,000 are zeroed in, or they're, they're marked here, they're noted. And uh, have you ever had. And Jehovah Witness come to your door? Some of you are chuckling a little bit already because it wasn't too long ago that your Jehovah Witness friends would have said there's only 144,000 that are ever going to be redeemed. That are going to go into the kingdom. That, that's it. And they base it kind of on this passage. But the scripture, the scripture tells us there's a great multitude and etc. And, so, and I believe, if, I'm, if, I, if I remember right, the... Uh, the Jehovah Witness friends have kind of changed their tune a little bit about that. The 144,000 have a special role, but other people are going to make it too. Yeah. And so, but anyway. Uh, but what's interesting about who knocked on your door when, uh, when, when they came? Two. 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 Mm -hmm. uh -huh, two witnesses. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, we won't go, we'll go, won't get too deep. Were they always men? No. no, often not. Sometimes it was a man and his son. Sometimes it's a, it's a woman and a daughter, or whatever, you know. Sometimes, did you notice the makeup of the 144,000? They're all men. They're Jews. They're all men. They're virgins. He mentions that in two different ways. Anyway, the point is, is that that God, oh, and they're great singers, by the way. Did you notice that? I think they'll out sing us, even though I don't know. It was, it's been great tonight. But they, they can sing that new song. But the bottom line, when we talk about these, they, they are going to be supernaturally saved and marked and set aside, and they're the result, I believe, of, the, of what's going on, the prophecy of the, uh, of the witnesses. When? Let's go to point number three. This is kind of easy, but I want to I give some simple points here as well. Notice in verse three, 1260 days. 
You do the math, but it ends up three and a half years. It ends up the same as it ends up the same as 42 months that we saw in verse two. So we have kind of repetition. I think there's some significance between saying 42 months and the days. I think there's some significance to that. I'm not going to bother with that at the moment. But uh, we, what we have here is half the tribulation. We have half the tribulation mentioned there. And for those of you that are calcul calculating, you, uh, pro prophetic days are 360 year days. Or prophetic years, excuse me. They're 360 year days, year, day years. And so don't get, don't get uh, tongue-tied like I just did. And don't try to add the 365, that kind of a thing. They're 360 and it adds up. And, and uh, how long is the tribulation? Seven. Seven years. Now, I know there are some who believe in a transition and this kind of thing. I'm not going to argue with that or worry about that. But we know that we have seven years based on Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. He talks about that 70th week and he talks about the time, that kind of a thing that is seven years and then half of this time. And so when we're dealing with the number of days, all right. But the big question is, when in the tribulation are we seeing these witnesses? And there might be a difference of opinion in the, in the room here. I understand that. Uh, but I am going to, my opinion is, and sometimes we have to base it on opinion and base it on you know, some of these things in Revelation, it's not crystal clear because you, you don't have everything just chronological order laid out exactly for a, spelled out, you know, very simply. My interpretation is, is these witnesses will witness in the first half. That's when, that's when their ministry will be. And uh, the 144,000, of course, will be saved during the whole time. The other people will be saved during the whole time, although I think it's going to be pretty tough in the last half. Uh, but one of the reasons I th uh, for the f being, uh, this being in the first half is that uh, tribulation saints enter the kingdom uh, at the end of the tribulation. And these guys, we see they were taken up with the Lord. They weren't just, they weren't just marched right into the kingdom. I can see there's, there's room for discussion on that. They have a lot of freedom to worship, to uh, minister there in, the, in, the, uh, right, you know, in Jerusalem. They have freedom to minister. And uh, I think in the second half, we see, we see a contrast to that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when the Antichrist has free reign. I mean, he has free reign. He's not bothered by these two guys that keep bugging him and saying these things about him and whatever. He's not bothered by that. And uh, so that's just another hint along the, along the way. Uh, I, think, I think, too... Notice I'm saying I think, all right? I'm, I'm trying to put some scriptures together. And, uh, you know, this is a little different than saying salvation is by grace through faith. And, you know, that is hard and fast and there's no I think or I wish or whatever. All right? We, but we have some things where there's some room for discussion. And uh, I'm sure some of you will talk to me yeah. afterwards. <laughs> but I still got eight minutes. All right. But, but the, idea, the idea here of the, I think this could be a neat, this could be a, a, a key thing when the beast takes power in mid-tribulation. We know, I, I think there's a great consensus, the beast is just going to come to the forefront in the middle of the tribulation. And I think one of the things that could help him, help him be displayed as all-powerful, shall we say, is that he kills these guys. I think this could be one of the things that, that, gives him, that gives him a leg up, shall we say. So those are kind of four reasons that I've given you. And, and uh, oh, I, here's my fourth one. People have time to respond after their deaths and give the gifts and all that kind of stuff. You know, if it was at the end of the tribulation and they were killed and then we go into the kingdom, there wouldn't be that time for the... Uh, the rebellious people to cheer their deaths and all this kind of stuff in my mind. All right, that's four reasons. Where? Number, notice back to verse three, where are they? They're before God. They're before God. They're standing before God. Their ministry is before God. Naturally, I think that means the temple. 
naturally uh, the temple would make sense to me here they are the most prominent place of worship in the in Jerusalem and these guys are are standing there and they are they are they are proclaiming the wickedness of uh, of Jerusalem and the people that they're like Sodom that they're like that they are like Egypt Sodom probably for their immorality, uh, Egypt for their idolatry, and much could be expanded on that idea tying in with verse 8. And notice in verse 8 too that John does not hesitate. He does not hesitate to tie this wickedness that he's talking about, Sodom and Egypt. He doesn't hesitate to tie that in with the crucifixion of Christ. So he's, you know, he's, he's tying in these three things to depict the the wickedness of Jerusalem at that day and this wickedness I think is just is just preparing the way the attitude is preparing the way for the Antichrist to take power remember the church is raptured there's unbelievers are the only ones left no wonder there's wickedness and there's great there's much more to consider when you consider you know consider that uh, that God's testimony is gone except from these witnesses, but we need to move along here a little bit. Uh, do, you, do you notice the idea that the whole world's going to know? Did you see that? The whole world is going to know that of their message, their message, their deaths, their resurrection, and their ascension. How's it going to happen? We can see it a lot better. I, I read some of these older commentaries and they're talking about newspapers. Half the kids in here don't know what a newspaper is, you know. And uh, the God's going to have a way to broadcast this, and, but we sure see it in our day. Instant news, instant. And, and, and uh, when we think about these people, uh, somehow, how is everybody going to know, hey, let's give gifts. And it surely wasn't waiting for print. You know, it's got to be some way that this is getting out there Man, we got a holiday here. Let's celebrate, and everybody jumps on board. And uh, you, we, you know, it, it kind of reminds me, reminds me of uh, Romans one thirty two, where people cheer each other on. The wicked cheer each other on, in Romans chapter one. But it's like our modern day, where where some of our the terrorists celebrate uh, the death of the innocent, and it just and it just uh, just the other day. Oh, it's a, two weeks ago, I guess. Bernie Sanders vitriol against Christ as he attacked, as he attacked uh, Russell Voigt. I don't know if you're up on that. You need to look at YouTube. But it's an it's attack on Christ. Mass media is going to get the news around. How? How are these guys going to do their job? Verse three, verse four, verse six, verse eleven, verse thirteen. All emphasize God Almighty. It is God. The awesome power of God is how these guys are going to do what God has them to do. It's going to be His power. He is in charge of all that we don't know about the who, what, when, where, and why, and how of these guys. He's, God has it is in control. And, I don't, and the things that I don't know are the things that I think. Doesn't matter because God's not going to be surprised. And I'm not going to worry about the exact timing. I've got to take you to verse 15. Romans chapter, come on back to chapter 11. I guess I took you out of there, didn't I? We've got to come back to verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. Now is that exactly right? You know, we've kind of broken up the timeline anyway. But I'm not going to worry about that so much. The seventh angel sounded. There was a loud voice. In, there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ." Anybody here remember where those words are? Where are they from? The Hallelujah Court. Can you imagine that? I don't know how many times I've thought of that. This is this is this is God at work in the tribulation. We get, we get wound up on some of the other things and who's going to do what or whatever, but this is God at work. And the kingdoms of this world, they belong to Him. I, I, I listened to the Hallelujah Chorus this afternoon a couple times. Just kind of listening to it. You know, and that just, 
I'm, I'm not going to do it because I can't do it justice. And then you'd all have to stand up anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but I, I, I couldn't help it as I read this, and I, I couldn't help of thinking of Handel's words there. And really, it gives us the why. This gives us the why of, of all that we look at in, in this book. Of all that we look at this book, that God does everything to bring Himself glory. Everything He does, he, it's, it's about Him. It's about Him. To give Him the glory. And I can imagine, I can imagine these two witnesses. And I can, I mean, the 144,000, they said a new song that nobody can even know? Uh, that they're the only ones that can sing it? Wow! God must be doing something, going to be doing something great in there. And can you imagine them singing that song as they enter in? As they, they're, on the, they're on the mount there and they're ready to enter in and bring in the kingdom. And I don't know. We get little hints of that in Revelation. You go back to chapter 4, verse 11, and, and they're, they're singing around the throne. That you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Here we are at the end, and he goes back to the beginning. You think God has a purpose? Chapter 5 and verse 11 talks about thousands upon thousands of voices saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and glory, and wisdom, strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. Our gospel is the epitome. It's the epitome of worship as we recognize that Christ has died for us, paid the penalty for our sin. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard, uh, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Can you say it with Handel? Hallelujah. 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 Heavenly Father, our puny hallelujah isn't enough. Lord, we pray that as we read the marvelous things that you are going to do, I pray that we would be exalting you, magnifying you. You have brought us such, wonderful, such a wonderful creation of which we're a part. You have brought us such an awesome salvation. And we know that you planned it before the foundation of the world. We know that your power is, is greater than anything we can even imagine. Father, teach us a new song. A song of hallelujah. Amen.